Tango is a chiclet, which is the question of uh, the sexual revolution. Being okay, right? Right? When? I'm, am I correct? Yes. Okay, go ahead. Because, you know, you have to emphasize three things that could change. Okay. Remind to the students. Okay, good, good. Go ahead. Yeah, so in this case, the uh, change that uh, magnetic flux is experiencing is, well, dependent on the area that is changing at a constant yeah, yeah. Area, right? Because the area... Yeah, because is, you move the wire, then there's a change area, right? Yeah. So then, you have a... Yeah, okay, go ahead. Then. So, so then the, the rod, since the rod moves the negative x direction, right, uh, the total area is changing at a constant rate. well depends on these two dimensions the length of the rod which is l and the change right the the rate of change of the width which is described by dx d well dx dt is nothing but the velocity and so d a d t is then um, l d dx dt which is l b so negative b l b is emf so use that equation to calculate um, the induced EMF. So let me know what number you get. Could you explain how could you explain how EMF is negative B L V again, like the, the up equation up? Yeah. So remember that from Faraday's law more than that. It's like a from Faraday's law voltage that is induced in the circuit, right? By a change in flux. Flux is phi. And so if, if phi depends on the area, right, because flux, well, flux is, uh, you know, it's, it's going to be um, magnetic field multiplied by the area. And it's going to be also multiplied by the cosine of uh, theta, the angle between them. Because if, you know, if you have a different um, combination where the magnetic field goes in one direction, and it, then the area vector is perpendicular is in, in a different direction, then the angle between them will uh, definitely affect the flux, right? Because the cosinus of theta will change, and so the flux will change. But in this case, flux is the same; is not dependent on the angle. It's not flip. It's not. It's not uh, spinning, right? The rod is not spinning, and the whole cross-sectional area is uh, changing. So what we have changing over here is is the area. So that's why we. Uh, take the derivative, right, with respect to time of the area. Uh, magnetic field is constant, right? It's uniform and it's into the page. DADT is dependent on the dimensions L over here, right? And the width. But what happens to the width? It's changing. Right. And then how do we know? As you can right. see. Right. And then how do we know that? Yeah. Well, when I think what he, what my understanding from his question, okay, I cannot see the screen, but I understand his question this. How do you use this minus, Faraday laws is EMF equal to minus ND phi MDT, right? When he said, what he meant is this. When you move this rod, right, in the magnetic field, you change the area, that's correct. But the area change, if you move to make the, make the loop bigger, then phi m increases. Right? Phi m increases, then what the electromotive force does, that's the Lenz law. You have to emphasize that's the Lenz law. Lenz law says the induced EMF will make the current with the, like a battery. The battery direction is to make the current to resist your increase of phi m. You get it? Because when you, let's say when you move this rod to make the area bigger, then the phi m become bigger. If phi m become bigger, if phi m in a certain direction, then the electromotive force, the battery, the battery will make a current to resist your increase bigger. So it will go the opposite direction of phi m. I think that's what he meant. It, right. like, like, also, students, like, like also correct? The, when you, when you say- I understand your question correctly. When you say E is equal to negative D flux over DT, like how, how is that true? Like, is that just a... Yeah, because, because see, when you move the rod, right, the area changes, right? The area right. change, the phi M changes, right? 
fire can become bigger or smaller, right? Right. Right. If fire become bigger, then they induce the EMF. This battery, the, because the, 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 not the, the loop is like a battery. The battery will make the fire become smaller. The opposite direction. This is what the lens law is, right? So you, you, don't, um, you don't quite understand why, why EMF is minus d by dt. Right. Yeah, minus. Yeah, this minus sign is the lens law. Yeah. yeah, so let me show you something. Uh, let me because I think it might not have been clear in the previous lecture. So I'm going to show you, I'm not sure if I show you the uh, simulation. I didn't show you, right, the simulation on uh, Fed Lab. So let me share this uh, screen with you. And I'll show you what, I, what it means by minus D phi DT on, on the uh, Fed Lab. I'm not sure if you have tried it already. Uh, you just type Fed uh, Colorado Physics Labs. On Google, and then it pops up as a bunch of different simulations, uh, you know, for different physics topics. And in this case, we're talking about Faraday's law, so you can look for that. But now I'm going to show it to you, and I'll clarify your doubt. Uh, share the screen with you. Um, can you see the uh, the Google? Yeah. Okay, so let's go here. There is Colorado simulations. And then we're going to go to the physics section. So right here. And we're going to go this one. I think this one. Yeah. Let's take a look at this. Colorado is long. Well, here's the thing. So when you put a magnet, you put a magnet. If you take a magnet, mm -hmm. and then you have a coil of wire. It's connected to some uh, load. Well, the load in this case is the light bulb. And so what happens here? You have an ammeter that measures the amperage, right? The the, the current flowing through the wire. Uh, you know. I, Logically, there's no current flowing through the wire because there's no battery, right? There's no battery connected anywhere. So how, how are you going to get that current flowing? Well, by experiment, by by uh, experimental observation, if you put a magnet, right? If you if you put a magnet through a coil of wire, you move it at some constant speed over here. If you can see, if, if I move it at a constant, what's the current? What's the current on the circuit? None, right? But now, if I increase the speed, then the current is going to be huge. So what this means is that I'm changing what's called uh, flux. So, but what I mean by flux is um, magnetic field lines that come out of the North Pole will go like this, and then they're going to come back. They're going to come back to the South Pole. So what I mean by flux is that. Uh, this cross-sectional area, right, the cross-sectional area of the loop, which is a circle, mm -hmm. uh, is going to be constant, right? The area is not constant. So, so when we talk about EMF, when we talk about, um, oh, you said, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, let me actually erase that. I'll just enable the, I'll just click here, and then the field line should pop up. All right, uh, so, so what I mean is the cross-sectional area that's, um, you know, in the circle is, uh, well, is it constant or is it changing? What's happening? It's not, it's not changing, right? How could you change the cross-sectional area? Is there a way you can change it? How can you change this? By changing the wire, like the moving the... 
Yeah, pretty much. You change, you have to crush the wire, you have to expand it or somehow change the area. But in this case, it's not happening. So we can say that we know well, we know that flux, magnetic flux is um, it's going to be the open integral of the dA, where area is um, of, yeah, this keeps happening. But, um, let me try it again. Area is not changing. So what happens is dA, right, is flux. So that is phi. And when we find the rate of change of phi, so d phi dt, we find that it's zero, right, at this point. In this instant, when the magnet is not working at all, d phi dt is zero because area is the same and magnetic field is the same. But then what happens, right. what happens when we move the magnet? Well, what's changing? Is it the area or is it the magnetic field? Magnetic, magnetic field. Why is the magnetic field changing? Because the distance is changing. The distance. Well, respective, it's a distance with respect to each magnetic field line. So each magnetic field line has a different spacing right, as it comes outward. So the spacing over here is much greater than the spacing over here. And when the spacing is less, well, it's stronger magnetic field. So we have a changing magnetic field for each cross-sectional area. So if in this, in this <laughs> case, the cross-sectional area is, is, um, is being uh, crossed by the four magnetic field lines in that specific configuration, right, with that specific spacing. And then when I move it, when I move it, it's creating a change in the, in the field, even though it's very, very mild, because of that, the magnetic field lines are, are weak, right? Because the spacing is greater. So if I right. move it, it's not going to be very strong. You see the voltage is very, very, um, in the bulb, the bulb meter, it's very, very mild. Um, it's a very mild uh, changing in voltage, right? So the induced EMF is slow, but then, when the magnetic field line is stronger, right? When, so when we come closer, then the induced voltage is greater. So it's basically act like a battery. And um, of course, um, what we're changing is D. So then uh, we can say that the ADT is zero in this case, right? This specific case. And so we only have. It's ended, right? No. Uh, equal to EMF in this case, right? Now for other cases, right? The example I was showing you in one note presentation, I'm going to go back to that. Uh, what's changing is magnetic field, but the area, the area is the one that changes in that case. So, so what's happening is, the magnetic field, right, in this, in this example, is going into the page and it's uniform. It's not changing. So DBA, right. DBDT is zero, but DBDT is changing because the cross-sectional area that goes over here, right, this cross-sectional area is changing with respect to time, right? The, the, the velocity is a change of displacement. So the width, and if the width changes, so this is dx dt, and if you multiply the width by the length, you get the area, and that's why we have L D X D T. And D X D T can be right. So does that answer your question? Thanks, Mike. Thank you. All right, now try this example. So let me know what EMF you get. You gotta use EMF equals minus D phi D T. Of course, we derive the already. So just use EMF equals uh, minus B times the length times the velocity, or blimp. Some professors even say blimp, just to uh, like kind of like a mnemonic to, to remember. You have a changing area with a constant with a constant speed. So EMF equals blimp, BLV, magnetic field times length times velocity. I give you all the parameters, so it should be easy to calculate. You just gotta do some, um, you gotta know that, you know, 100 equals one meter. The um, stoichiometric calculation.
you get. Did anybody get any answers? Equals minus zero point thirty five Tesla's multiply by zero. I mean, if you want to split it, you could say twenty five centimeters. And you do the stoichiometry from one to one hundred. So you do one meter divided by one hundred centimeters. Centimeters cancel out, you're left with that. You use it by 100. By the velocity, uh, which is uh, 55 centimeters per second. So, make a space here. So, just do that, EMF. This expression, let's call it, um, well, this BL minus 55 uh, centimeters per second. Then, of course, by by 100, and then you should get the answer. Calculators. So let's keep going. And um, so you get minus 48 millivolts. Okay. So you use the you know the dimensional analysis. Okay, and uh, and then you should get uh, 48 millivolts. Minus 48 millivolts because remember that the negative sign in front of minus d phi dt represents uh, Lenz's law, right? So Lenz's law. Is a function of energy consequence. So what it says, I don't know. If it's not what it says, is that um, so? Let's go back to the simulation. So let's go back to the simulations. So what I mean by Lenz's law, right? When uh, EMF is minus d phi dt, the negative sign. And the negative sign is uh, simply saying that uh, if you aren't generating, you know, if you're generating energy out of out of uh, motion, right? Because you're 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 uh, changing the magnetic field, right, with respect to the position in the cross-sectional area. So we is that um, you have to have an oppo opposite magnetic field that will oppose, right, the change in the flux. So this flux that you're changing, right, has to be opposed. By some other magnetic field, but where where is the magnetic field going to come from? Where, where does that magnetic field come from? Magnetic field that has to oppose this change. Where does it come? From? Who wants to answer that question? Right, when I call it to generate voltage EMF, that's an induced EMF. And like I said, in front of Faraday's law, right, minus d phi dt has to do with the magnetic field that will oppose this change. So what happens? Where does that magnetic field come from? Any suggestions? Any guesses? Exactly. But make the field which which law or which concept which concept tells it okay so you there you go you're going back to the current concept so when you have a current right flowing through some wire you know for sure by uh by uh bio sub r law right you can derive this using bio sub r law uh, you can you know that a current carrying wire must must generate a uh, magnetic field in the uh, perpendicular direction okay increasing okay in decreasing in magnitude right 
as the inverse square of the distance uh, from one point of space to the point of the wire. So what do I mean by that? Well, this coil of wire has to generate a magnetic field when it's the current is flowing through it. So that field, okay, has to have a specific direction. So if I move it in, if I move the magnet, the North Pole magnet, we know that the magnetic field will go, uh, will go to the left, right? So it's going on the left, and we're generating a net uh, EMF, right? Just like we see in the uh, ammeter and the voltmeter, we generate negative EMF. So then it has to be a negative current, right? Direction. So what, what direction, okay? Uh, current flowing in the coil so that it, okay, um, by the direction of the magnetic field that's already going through. So you have to oppose you have to oppose the direction of this field coming in. This is field one, V1. This is what this is what generates right a change in magnetic field once you move the magnet in and out. And so well, somebody said counterclockwise. So if you if you imagine right using the thumb rule, if it's moving counterclockwise, then using the thumb rule, we're going to find out right that the motion of the field that it's generating is going to go opposite to the original magnetic field. And that's Lenz's law. Lenz's law that um, energy is conserved pretty much. That's what it's telling. That's what. That's all it says. Energy has to be conserved. So then, if you generate some change in uh, magnetic flux, right, that creates creates electric energy, ele an electric potential, it has to be opposed, um, you know, by an opposite uh, change in magnetic flux. So that current has to have a specific uh, amperage, right? Has to have a specific uh, uh, magnitude. So that the magnetic field magnitude, right, uh, will be equal and opposite to B1, and you can find that using the ideas of our law. If you remember, um, our law will be will be what equation for the general case. You had a um, you have mu zero, right? The perme permeability of free space multiplied by the the current, okay, the current flowing through. Uh, is going to be divided distance which is 2 pi times r right do you agree this is the general case and then it's multiplied by the angle phi in uh, degree in uh, radians so, okay and this is the measure of the magnetic field uh, in the general case for loops of wire right this is for wire this only works for loops of wire so if you if you substitute phi right which is the angle that covers the entire the entire uh, wire Okay, in this case, what's the angle that, that, um, that the wire is covering? What's the angle of the loop? Is it 90, is it 180, or how long, how much uh, in radians? Two pi, two pi radians, yeah. So two pi radians, so B must be zero pi. I think this one over here is, so it's gonna be a divide by two R. Um, in BSA Barlow, there's a mu zero over four pi. So, um, from this, right, you can you can say that this magnetic field yeah, yeah, right, yeah. was gone. I, I I think I really cannot handle this. Okay. Yeah, I'm okay. Yeah, go ahead. So so then if we do dB right dB dt from both. You know the radius, the radius of the loops is constant. What's changing is the current. The current must change okay, in accordance to um, the magnetic field. And so we have the on the other side. But this current that changes, right, must be changing, okay, uh, so that this magnetic field uh, is basically the same magnetic field that uh, you're putting from the yeah. magnet, right? Why yeah. do they have to be the same? Why do they have to be the same? Because of conservation of energy. You're generating energy out of nowhere. You can do that, right? And then it must, must be uh, conserved. So it cannot be created nor destroyed. So what you do when you generate some field over here, 
it's, it's energy that you're uh, generating, right? The current doesn't come out of nowhere. Uh, so the motion that you apply on it, okay? Oh, right. Current, right? When, you put, when you put the magnet through it, that makes the current go, right? When you put okay. the magnet, so when you uh, introduce this magnet, when you change the velocity, right? Basically the rate of change that it displaces, okay? Then the, the magnetic field changes constantly, right? So the ability holds is not zero. So the ability is mu zero di dt divided by two uh, r. In that, in that case, uh, of course, it depends on how many loops you have. So you multiply, you multiply. Um, this that, wait. So you multiply uh, the value of the magnetic field by some number n, which is the number of loops that you have. You have four loops over here. So you can multiply by four. So four over two is basically two. The, the rate of change of the mass with respect to time. Um, and then, uh, of course, it has to oppose the uh, flux, the change in flux. So this is, uh, this is Lenz's law in Faraday's law. And Lenz's law is the negative sign. Lenz's law uh, is the negative sign. Uh, for Barbie, Question is to find the current, right? If there is 100, I mean, uh, 18 ohms, right? So it's very simple. You do, uh, you do, law, right? Ohm's law is basically V equals IR. Oh, look at that code. So V equals IR. And um, all you have to solve for is I, right? You already know what. Well, EMF, which is minus 48 millivolts, you know the resistance, so so for I, and then you get, uh, you get a six amps. So now the question is, what direction is flow? Well, that depends on Lenz's law, right? So if the um, if the magnetic field, right? So, so, so think about the magnetic field that's in the in the uh, in the over here. So the magnetic field goes in which direction? Well, it goes out of the pitch, right? Because the dots represent it, that the magnetic field comes out of the pitch. It comes out of the pitch, it's constant, right? What changes is the area. And you can, uh, you, you, all you want to keep in your mind, right, is that the direction of the current has to be in such a way that the magnetic field it produces is opposed to uh, the dots, right? So you want to have more crosses. So how do you do that? You make sure that you're, you're using thumb you point your four fingers into the pitch, and then you just curl, you, you, you just twist your hand, right, in a circular manner, and then you find which direction the current is, and you find that it's clockwise. Just like it's uh, shown over here, it's clockwise. So that the field that generates, right, is going to go into the pitch. So you're going to have crosses. And this is called the induce. Has to be coming up to, uh, to the change, right? In proportion, change in area in this case, right? In the other case, it will have to be equal and opposite to the actual magnitude of the magnetic field. But in this case, it's not the same thing because what changes is not magnetic field, but the area. So the greater the change in the area, the greater you have to put more crosses, with greater uh, magnitude, with greater strength. So if the speed, right, if the speed is very low, right, rate of change of the area is low, but it's constant. It's a constant rate of change. So the magnetic field induced will, will have to increase, right? Okay, then uh, they ask you for the power uh, dissipated in the wire. So you use the power equation. Uh, which is uh, the voltage squared divided by the resistance, substitute the values for EMF and resistance. You get 1.28 watt, uh, times 10 to the negative 4 watts. Um, of course, you can also use the current because you already know what the current is. Uh, it's going to be 2.67 milliamps in the clockwise direction. Or you can 
these both equations, i square r or square over r. Now, to find the power, uh, to the force needed, right, to move this rock at constant speed, you have to set power equals to force times velocity, and it's going to be um, I induced times L B L uh, B D, right? So then you substitute your values to find and you can find from this the force, right? you can find the force um, required to keep this moving at a constant speed. Okay, induced current in EMF, a particular loop of wire is in a uniform field uh, covering the area over here. Okay, so the question is, um, which of the following will not cause a current to be induced in the loop? Sliding the loop into the field region or from the far left, or rotating the loop about an axis perpendicular to the field lines. Okay, so try to picture that in your heads. The magnetic field is going into the page. Okay, perpendicular um, to the field lines is going to be the loop. C is when you keep the orientation of the loop fixed and moving it along the field line. C is crushing the loop, right? So think about what happens when you crush the loop, what is changing. And E is lighting the loop out of the field region uh, from left to right. So what is not causing a change in current? Somebody said C. Or how do you know which way to spin your hand? Sure, you're talking about the previous. Yeah, so no problem. Um, remember, remember that uh, in this case, okay, um, you have to make sure that you follow, right? You follow the circuit. So you have to put your four fingers, which represent the magnetic field, into the page because that's going to be the opposite direction to the original magnetic field. So you go into the page and then you just twist your hand, right? You don't want to put it in the opposite direction because the thumb represents the direction of the current. You just go along the direction of the current. And that is clockwise. But but how would you know that? Like how, how would you know to rotate it that way as opposed to the other way? Like, how do you know the current? Because you have to use... Remember that the again, thumb again like this is Lenz law. Again, this is the Lenz law. <laughs> when you talk about direction, it's always the Lenz law. Lenz's law is the, the concept that if you have, you know, magnetic field that comes into the page, right? So magnetic field comes to me, it comes towards me. But then you want to have magnetic field that comes to you, right? So right. it goes into the page. Right. And at this point, yeah. how do you know which way the roads are rotating? So at this point, no, because if the, if the magnetic field gets into the page, then the EMF wants to generate uh, the current, which, you know, the magnetic flex goes out resist because if the if the d5 dt is the magnetic flux goes into the page then the response of the emf is making the flux goes out because emf will have a current this current will have a magnetic flux this magnetic flux will go out this is called lens law You get it because in 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 a, in, a, in, a, in a circuit in a loop whatever you have now if the d phi dt the change of the flux is let's say going into the page yeah, yeah I get that I get the, that part I just didn't know when you when you when you first point your fingers into the page and then you have your thumb pointing yeah, to the yeah. left how do you know which way to start rotating to see where the current what, what rotate what rotate you mean the circuit ro rotate? There no, the, 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 there's no rotate. There's no rotation. It's, it's the current. It, the electromotive force to have a re, has a response. It's response of a current. Right, no right. But, like when you do the right hand rule, you put your hand. I mean, you're, you put your yeah. fingers into the page because that opposes the the uh, the magnetic field that's coming out. But then, how do you know to rotate clockwise or, or counterclockwise your hand to see where the current goes? Yeah, it's always used only right hand. You never use left hand. Okay. Right. 
I don't know because uh, yeah, right hand. Let's say the 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 change of the phi. Right? You can you can change with the B with the A with the with the angle. When the phi changes, let's say if the phi changes, the phi is goes in becomes goes in bigger and bigger, right? Let's say goes in bigger and bigger. Then in the loop you have a electromotive force which is battery. Then the battery will have a current. The current will generate it's a it's a it's a phi. This phi will coming out to resist because your 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 initial thing goes in increases right phi increases. So how do you how do you make the in, increases negative? So you 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 generate the EMF that which goes out. So this is called Lenz law. Did I make it clear? I, sorry that I it, it, on the on the board on the blackboard on the. On the board is easy to explain, but here right, right. I'm, I'm, I, I don't, I cannot get access to the screen. You know? oh, well, well, like I, I, I understand that part, but I just don't get which, what, like when you put your fingers into the page. Yeah, you, you know how you, Juan, you know how you said then you started rotating. Yeah, uh, you yeah. Started, like how do you know to do that as opposed to the other way? Well, here's the thing. Keep in mind the. Uh, you have to keep in mind when the area. Are uh, looking at like so the cross section area that is changing is going to be this right so this is the area that changes so you have to keep in mind that specific area you don't care you don't care about what's going on outside so this field that comes outside it doesn't really matter what matters is the field that goes inside so that's key yeah. you know which direction you want to spin your finger your tongue because if you think if you start right let's say uh, well you might Counterclockwise, right? But what happens if you if you rotate it counterclockwise? Remember that the thumb rule is basically you curl your finger, your four fingers are around your thumb, and that's the magnetic field. So the magnetic field. So this is the direction, oh right? so okay this is the thumb, right? Okay. And then the magnetic field. The magnetic field. Um, wait, this is this is not uh, this is current. Right? So the magnetic field has to go around it, right? Like that. Right. Perfect. It will it will go like it's pretty much infinite, but the problem is the magnitude is decreasing as the inverse square of the distance according to um, Pierce law. If you remember, um, Pierce law is uh, well. Let's see if I can remember. dB is equal to mu zero, right? Divided by four pi, multiplied by the cross product. Remember, by the current, and then you have to remember the cross product between dB, right? D, dL. Okay, you have dL. And you cross it with the unit vector of the direction of, of whatever position you're looking at. So that's called R hat. But of course, R hat is a unit vector, the magnitude is one, and you divide by the square of the distance. So it's inverse to the square of the distance. So eventually, you know, the magnetic field is going to die out very quickly um, in magnitude. But it's always it's always perpendicular. If we talk about the plane, the plane of the magnetic field is perpendicular to I, to this direction of the thumb. So this is this is the plane. What I mean by the plane is this is this is the plane, right? And this, the magnetic field, excuse me, the current, okay, the current which goes normal to the plane of the magnetic field. It's always 90, right? That's what we say normal. 90 degrees to that in all direction. All direction. Because it's a plane and in the plane you have the current going up. And so that's why we say thumb rule because the the uh, this um, Fingers are simply uh, several lines, right, uh, of the magnetic field for each each section of the wire. So this is, if if you look at this part, this will be the wire. And so we think of these fingers to be the direction of the current lines. But ideally, of course, it's a circular, a circular magnetic field. So it always curls around the thumb. Um, but of course, in this case, you want to make sure that you pay attention where your your area, your objective area is. Because this area is key to find where the direction of the induced current is. And why is it in the clockwise direction? Well, because if you do the thumb rule, right, what is going to be the direction outside of the uh, field? Well, it's going to be um, it's going to be into the page, right? If you think about it, well, it's going to be out of the page, outside of the of the area, right? But in the area, it's going to be into the page. So that's the that's the red crosses. The red cross represents field going into the page, but uh, the induced current also but outside of the circuit, it doesn't matter, 
What matters is inside of the area that's changing. Okay. Right? You want to make sure, because if you go counterclockwise, what happens is that the area, the, uh, the induced current is producing right. a field coming out. So you want to make right. sure it's going in. Okay. Thank you. No problem. So here's a question for you. All right. Somebody answered it already. Okay. It's C. Uh, why is it C? And moving it along the field lines. Why C? Why why does this not cause a, a uh, current, an induced current? Why you, you have the magnetic field coming in this direction, and then you're going to move the loop going into the page. The field goes into the page, and then you have the loop. You move it along the, the field lines, right? You move it along the lines. So it's have two uh, long, uh, you know, wire, like uh, two long uh, iron, uh, you know, sticks. And then you have a loop moving it along the sticks. So what happens is it's not, it's not moving right or left, it's not spinning. So the angle theta is not uh, changing, right? Theta is, is uh, d, a, d, d theta dt is zero. So d, cos, d, d cosine theta dt is zero, and the area gain, right? So like for part, you're crushing the loop. So that means that you're changing the cross-sectional area. So you could have something like this, and the area will be less. So the dt will not be constant, right? But you want to make sure you have no d of dt of this whole thing to be equal to zero. And when this, when is this zero? Well, when the magnetic field is constant. When the area is constant and then the theta is constant, when all of those are constants, then you have no inducement. And like um, Aaron said, C is the right answer because if you keep the orientation of the loop right in the same position, the same configuration, and then you move it along the field lines, it's the same for all uh, you know time. Like if, if you measure the time uh, as it goes along the field lines, theta doesn't change. The A cross sectional area doesn't change and the field is even more. So D, V, D, T is zero and EMF is zero. So uh, we talked about Lenz's law already. Um, let's just uh, recap. And of course, we said Lenz's law um, wants, to, wants to oppose, right, change in the magnetic flux. So over here, we have a nice demonstration, okay, of what, what's happening. So we have, we have, uh, a magnetic field um, that is changing, it's increasing, right, in magnitude. So it's basically, you got a magnet, you bring it, bring it at a speed, right, at some changing speed, some acceleration, right, you apply a force of the magnet, you bring it into the loop, B is increasing, so DVDT is not zero. DVDT is, 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 has a, some value. So if DVDT is not zero, EMF is not zero, right, because this is minus D phi B, D minus d phi dt, nothing but minus the d a cosinus of theta dt. And so if it's increasing, right, you're going to have field lines in this direction. Uh, I mean, ideally, a magnet would be something like that, right? But uh, what I mean is if it's going in this direction, you want to make sure that the induced magnetic field, right? the magnetic field, you have to uh, have to oppose that uh, existing magnetic field, that increasing magnetic field, has to be opposite to the original. How do you do that? Well, the current has to go in this direction, right? Has to go in that direction. Why? Is the thumb rule? If you if you if you imagine the loop, right? So just try to. It's hard to visualize three D stuff sometimes, but just try to see like a perspective. So my perspective could be, let's say. Uh, I am the I am the uh, magnet, right? So if you're the magnet, you're coming into the loop, and think about um, if if the lines are going forwards, right? You want to have lines, field lines that are going backwards, opposite to this direction. So which direction is going to be the current? Well, you think about it, and uh, if you think about it, you do the thumb rule. You want to make sure that the area, the cross-sectional area that you have, is where the field lines are going to be entering. So you have coming the field lines coming out of the page right coming towards you and then you start spinning along the, the loop and you see that it has to be counterclockwise okay 
example. So here we have uh, uh, several examples. But of course, over here, a little bit uh, of a different example, right? The field lines that are coming, okay, that are going forward, right? If I am the magnet, right? You are, you are the magnet. So think about uh, the person the magnet. The field lines are coming forward, but they are decreasing in magnitude. If it's decreasing in magnitude, you want to have uh, an increase in magnitude, right? Because it's you want to oppose that thing. So you want to have a clockwise direction of the, uh, excuse me, a counterclockwise direction if you are the magnet. It has to be counterclockwise, right? So that it's, um, no, it's, it has to be clockwise. Yeah, clockwise. It's a little, a little thermal there. You have, you have to, you know, kind of do like that, right? So it has to go clockwise so that field lines, okay, go um, forward because you want to oppose that change. If it's decreasing, you have want to have field lines. So the current has to increase. Okay, so it's the same for this in different directions. Here's an example for you. You know, this uh, originates from Biosabara law. This is the right. We derived this earlier. I think you were able to see the better version, okay, of the lecture. Usually, you know, this lecture is much better than the previous one because I'm much less prepared for the previous one than this. So, uh, Bios and uh, we, we were able to derive this fully. So, you can remember that this is uh, is basically the specific case, right, of Bios and Barlow for a circuit, a, a, a line, right, a wire. Because in this case, um, it's different, right? You do integrate all the contributions of the magnetic field from the specific point that you want. So, I think the question is uh, a circular loop of wire, right? Okay, um, at a constant speed. Uh, and it's going to go through the line, right? So, it's going to go, it's going to cross the wire that carries the current in the negative x direction. So, the question is, um, what is the direction of the induced current in the loop of wire, okay, in this specific possession? What is, what is the direction of the current? This specific current in this position, what's going to happen? Is the current clockwise? Is it counterclockwise? What do you think? A clockwise, so I would like that, right? So if somebody else says counterclockwise, okay, so let's find what happens in both cases. Now, in both cases, well, for, for the clockwise direction, uh, do the thumb rule, right? And so if you, thumb rule, you have your thumb, right, moving in the counterclockwise direction, so you curl your fingers way so that the area that goes in in your loop right is covered by field lines and you see that the field lines are going to be into the page for that um, area for the inner loop but of course it's going to be the page outside right but we don't really care about what's going on outside now for the current too goes clockwise I mean counterclockwise it's gonna be a bit different right it's just the opposite the field lines will go into the page in the inner loop, in the inner section of this loop, go outside, okay, outside of the loop. It's going to come into the page. Right? But we don't know what's going on outside. So think about, first of all, what's happening, right, in the moment, uh, in the specific uh, moment. The loop is moving with a constant speed, right, V, it's moving down. But what happens to the magnetic field, right? That is already present. The magnetic field. Wire. What what's happening to that field? Is it changing, or is it constant? It says it says it's a steady current, right? When they say it's a steady current, if this if this value is steady, right, it's constant. What happens with di dt? Well, di dt is zero, right? So if di dt is zero, db dt must be zero. So the field is constant. Magnetic field is constant, and therefore, 
um, there's no other like change, right? In, in area or angles theta because the loop, okay, the loop is not crushed, right? This, this cross section of area loop here is not changed whatsoever, right? It's the same. Even if it moves at a speed of light, it's still the same. But of course, we will not talk about uh, relativistic speeds because that might be a different uh, case, right? But in any how, in any way, uh, the area is the same, right? The loop itself is not spinning, right? It's not spinning. Like it could spin on its own axis. It could go like like this, right? So if this is my if this is the loop, right? I could spin it, and the angle theta is changing, but it's not changing. It's the same. It's just moving down at a constant speed. That's all. So what's happening? No changing angle, no changing area, and no changing magnetic field. So EMF is what? The R. The R is. It doesn't change like this R in the B magnetic field formula. That doesn't refer to the distance to the magnetic source. The R over here, remember from the use of R law, is um, very specific this to the uh, to the distance um, of the magnetic field, right? And, um, but it's this is the radius of the loop. This over here will be the radius of the loop of wire. Right, so if the radius uh, is not changing, so if you were to if you were to be expanding this loop of wire, then the force will be changing. But in this case, it's not changing. Right, it's the same. R R, which is the radius of the loop, is, is the same. So in that case, we know d theta. Well, d cosinus theta is constant, right? Over dt with respect to time is zero. We know d a d t. The cross sectional area is zero. We also know that, um, well, di dt is dependent, right? This no, this is the independence, okay, on the magnetic field. Magnetic field is on current. So d depends on di dt, but because di dt is zero, then dv dt has to be zero as well, okay? So this is good, this is good. All of them are zero, it's constant. So what's the MM? Uh, now what happens over here? So now imagine that the loop of wire is crossing the wire, right? So the loop is crossing the straight wire. So we have okay, the new loop is going to be the new loop is going to be somewhere over here, right? And it's at some uh, constant speed v in the downward direction, negative y direction. And, uh, and we, we have a different story, right? So what's happening? Where, where will be the direction of the... We have, I have to talk a little bit about this one. Okay. You have different directions of the magnetic field, right? You have magnetic field going into the page for the upper, uh, for the upper wire, for the first... Uh, top half of the wire, and then you have magnetic field going into the for the lower portion of the wire. So think about in terms of rate of change, right? first time the what's happening? How does this um, affect the direction of the current? Right? How come the magnetic field is changing now? Isn't the current still constant? Right, the current is constant, yeah. So why is the magnetic field changing, right? Why, why is it? It's, it's changing clearly, right? But why? It's moving, right? It's moving at a constant speed. So what's happening? We have a decrease, right? So let me let me call let me call the d v okay d v um, uh, in the okay in going. So dBx, dB cross dt, what happens to dB cross dt for this section of the wire, right? So for the, I'm talking about the, this cross section of area, right? We only care about what's inside, what's inside of this uh, cross section of area. Clearly over here, right, in the top example over here, the cross section of 
area had a constant right a constant flow of the same strength magnetic field lines so dvdt was zero so dbx dt was zero it's not changing but now over here dbx dt okay is changing and it's less than zero because it's decreasing you have less less crosses right you have less crosses means that the magnetic flowing into the page is decreasing on the bottom section of the wire we see that um we see that um db dot dt is represented by the right the magnetic field that goes out of the page it's going to be greater than zero but why is that well because dots are increasing you have an increase in the number of dots and all of that depends on the velocity v right the rate of change of the position placement is is, is changing right with to time so db dt is greater than zero out of the page that goes into the page less than zero. One decreases, the other one decreases. One do you want to have more of? That is the point. So what, could the magnetic field be bo broken up into in and out components? Is that what you just did? In this, in this specific case, yeah. I mean, look at it. The wire is over here, right? The, the yellow wire is, is, is over here. So the wire carries a current in this direction. The current is the same, right? It's generating, right, using the thumb rule, it's generating magnetic field on the upper section of the wire, and then the lower section of the wire, in each direction, direction and magnitude. The, the direction is uh, opposite, but the magnitude is the same, right? So direction is opposite. Think about it, what changes here is not, is not the, uh, in reality, the magnetic field is not increased like you're not increasing the magnitude of the magnetic field, but what you're increasing is the flux, right? Because Faraday's law, Faraday's law doesn't talk specifically about changing magnetic field or changing area or changing uh, the angle between the and magnetic field vector. He talks about the changing flux very generally because it wants to, it wants you to think about what's happening to the flux. But of course, the concept of flux is not easy to grasp at first. But flux, remember, right? It's just it's just a certain section of area that we consider, okay, uh, to have a flow of some vector field, right? Some vector field flowing through a cross-sectional area is flux. We can calculate flux by multiplying, right, the magnitude of this area and the magnitude of the magnetic field, okay, going through that area. Magnetic field could be the same throughout the whole universe, right? It could be constant and uniform, same magnitude throughout the whole universe. But the flux is not the same for, um, you know, one meter, one meter rectangle and a two meter by two meter rectangle. It's different flux, like a different area. So in this case, we have a change in flux more specifically, right? But I call this dB cross and dB dot, right, to be more, more uh, explicit, uh, to be more visual. But in reality, what is changing is... Um, Phi, right? Phi B. So what the top? Well, D phi dt, right? D phi dt is going to be less than zero because dv dt is going to be decreasing. The number of the, the number of um, field lines going into the page are decreasing. You have less magnetic field lines for less area, which means less flux. So it's decreasing. While d phi dt for the lower portion of this wire, okay, it's going to be greater than zero. So you have an increase in, in general magnetic field for the lower portion, but then you have to take into account the direction, okay, of the increase in the uh, magnetic field. What is the direction of the increasing number of magnetic field lines is going to be out of the page, right? You have more dots than crosses as the wire moves down, as the loop moves down. You have more dots. So if you have more dots, you want to have more of what? Right? That's the question. What do you want to have more of to compensate, right? Because of conservation of energy, Lenz's law. What do you want to have more of, right? Because you want to have an opposition of um, this change in magnetic flux. Right, clockwise, yeah. Well, let's see. So if we imagine the current 
in the clockwise direction, you're going to have more crosses. So that's what you want to have more of, right? Because if the current goes clockwise, you do the thumb rule, you find that the direction of the magnetic field in that specific highlighted cross-sectional area goes into the page in an increasing uh, number of field lines okay, per area. So I can conclude that to be uh, complex per se. But once once the uh, the loop gets fully out of the um, yeah. below the, the line, it's just zero again because it's not changing? Yeah, pretty much. The number of uh, field lines coming out of the page are the same per unit area. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, very good. Okay, so now for this slide, we're going to the generator effect, right? So we already saw what happens, right, when you when you have a changing current, right? I think we did. Let's see. We we talked about we talked about when you have a Right, when you have um, these two rails of wire, right, connected by by a resistor. Um, they didn't show the resistor, but it should be. And the resistor, okay, um, the, the the wires, the the rails are conducting rails, right? There's some <coughs> some some conducted metal, and then this rod is moving at a speed, so the speed is changing the the total area, so the ADT is greater than zero. Uh, for this example, we saw that there's no change, right? Okay, because we're still we're moving the uh, loop, right? But it's along the um, field lines, and nothing's happening. Area same, the angle between the vector, the the normal area vector and the magnetic field vector is the same. So for this. It's not the magnetic field that's changing, it's not the current, and it's not the cross-sectional area, right? What's happening is flux is changing, right? Very keyword, flux. Flux is what changes it generally, right, for Faraday's law. And now for this example, we are seeing that, now we're seeing that this loop is spinning, okay, at some rate, uh, omega t, okay? This is uh, basically d theta dt, the first time derivative of angular displacement is uh, angular velocity. So that's the rate at which the loop is spinning. Um, and of course, uh, the theta is theta is the angle between the normal vector and hat, uh, which is basically dA. Okay, this is also called dA. And that's where Gauss's law comes from, right? His law says uh, integral, integral of d dot dA is zero for a closed surface. But then we're talking about open surfaces. So integral open surface of B dot dA, right, is going to be A, B, cosine. Cosine theta is not constant, right? Cosinus of theta changes as omega t increases, right? Omega t goes up, then theta goes up. But of course, it's a cyclic function. So it will go up, go down, go up, go down. It would just be a sinusoidal function, and so well, we can describe we can describe the EMF induced as a sinusoidal function as well, right? We just take the first time derivative of flux um, using Faraday's law, right? That's nothing but Faraday's law. So EMF induced, right? Because we know we know that uh, b dot n plus a is b a cosine of theta, and where theta is omega. Then b a cosinus of omega t, okay, will give you will give you flux, okay, maximum flux that you can have, because b times a right alone, b times a alone is basically um, b times a, okay, cosinus zero degrees, zero or some factor some factor of pi, right, n pi degrees. Okay, so. That goes to one or negative, but what we're saying is you have a maximum magnitude of flux. 
to that. So that's why you just substitute phi. Then you're just left with yeah, uh, phi b is phi max cosinus of omega b. Okay, so you can see the general trend, okay, for sinusoidal uh, oscillatory functions. Uh, you have you have the uh, you know general function uh, as a function of uh, angle angular displacement or angular velocity. In this case, you have um, the um, you have the flux described as a function of time, right? We're talking about Faraday's law, so that's why we change it to omega t because we have time parameter that we need to use uh, Faraday. So in this case, EMF right is minus d phi d. So we get the first time multiplied by negative of sinus omega t times phi max. First time derivative of cosinus is trivial to do, right? It's minus sinus. And if you don't know, there's a trick to do that. You just imagine the unit circle, right? Y axis, you can have sinus, you have minus sinus, and then you have the cosinus and the positive cos and the negative cosinus. And so you to derive, right, to differentiate to any grade you go counterclockwise. So that's the premise. So if you do that, you have that the first time derivative of um, phi, right, it's going to be um, sine, negative sine, but because we have a negative that cancels out, becomes positive. And we have BA omega sine omega, right, using the chain rule, bring that omega out. And this here can be substituted by EMF zero. Okay. This is the initial initial EMF, but why is that EMF? Okay. How come how come that when you multiply angular velocity by by um, flux, right, maximum flux, it gives you EMF? Why is that? Why why is this? Where does this become EMF zero, which is basically the uh, initial induced uh, voltage? Before it was For BAV, right? Was it BAV? BLV. Yeah, BLV. Very good. Yeah, it was BLV. It's analogous. It's analogous to angular uh, mechanics. So before it was BLV. Now, because we have a, uh, this is analogous to length, and uh, this is analogous to the velocity, but in angular, okay. Uh, Terms. So you have dA times uh, basic d, omega, d theta dt, right? Because what's changing over here is theta, right? When you have a change in theta, uh, then you're going to uh, you're going to have a change in flux, and that change in flux gives you EMF. That's why we call it EMF zero. How is L analogous to A? Because isn't A two dimensions and L is one? A is, uh, is one, right? But now here you have to think more like in three-dimensional uh, terms, right? Because now you have to think about the angle, right? At which it changes with respect to uh, B, right? So with this, this is B, right? And now this is N, right? So in the, the next one, it will be somewhere like over here, right? So let's say that the loop is over here. Now N will be somewhere over here, which means that, um, the angle between them will be about like 180 degrees. And so it reaches a maximum, right? But now, well, it's not the length, right? Because we don't really have the length, right? We don't have a change in length. Before, we needed to define um, a change in length, okay? Because we had a first two, one dimension, right? A length is one dimension, and speed can also be uh, one dimension, right? It's regular linear motion. Here you have one dimension. Um, and then you combine these dimensions, right? Multiply, find the product of one dimension. Uh, you have two dimensions, right? Now, when you have the product of uh, two dimensions, you're going to have three dimensions. So you're going to have a total of kind, kind of like a oval shaped, uh, like sort of three dimensional figure, okay? That is um, that is constantly okay changing the cross sectional area with respect. To Magnetic field, the direction of the magnetic field, and dA is not a constant, right? 
is constant, the A is constantly spinning, okay, in, um, in relative to the direction of the magnetic field. So we can derive that. We can do, for example, we did, um, we, you know, we started from scratch. We said that the ADT is changing, right? So over here, we know that uh, the flux, right, is going to have a maximum at B. So that's why we didn't have cosine theta. Over here, we don't have cosine theta because basically, okay, basically cosine of some theta over here has to be one. Why does it have to be one? Well, because what happens to the A, um, to, to the area, right? And the magnetic field. The magnetic field is perpendicular to the cross-section of area. Excuse me, it's in the same, that it's parallel to the same that, uh, to the, right? Because DA, uh, for example, I mean, you could choose DA to be um, in the same direction, right? So let's say that DA is going into the page. So this is DA, right? It goes into the page. Because this whole thing is the area. This is DA. And if magnetic field goes also into the page, right? What is the dot product? What is the dot product between DA? Well, it's going to be DA. But now in this case, we actually have to use um, that's why we have this when we take the first time derivative, uh, what we found to be the flux, right? So this is similar derivation, right? It's analogous. It's not the same, right? Clearly. But here, we can represent this to be the initial uh, voltage, BA, where omega. So this is the um, peak value, right? So it's it's EMF naught, but uh, it can also be called EMF max. Uh, this is the maximum voltage that you're going to induce. And um, when it's perpendicular to the magnetic field, right? That, that's going to uh, be uh, zero, right? Because the dot product, right? Is zero since the angle is 90. Uh, AC and DC generators and their difference. So alternating current, you know, circuits are based on the fact that uh, you have an alternating current uh, source, right? So it's it's and the basis of this has to do with electromagnetism, uh, Faraday's law, and this is why uh, you know I always say that Faraday's law runs the economy because without Faraday's law, well, you wouldn't have AC AC wouldn't have AC uh, voltage sources. And AC current is literally, you know, what, what uh, runs car. Uh, this is what uh, happens in factories, right? Uh, that uh, in, in, in power generators, right? When you go to um, a dam, right? These dams uh, absorb from the, from the river. And so the, the, the kinetic energy that comes from Right, the motion that comes from the water particles in the river will be will be um, into a change, right? A change in flux. And that change in flux, what happens with that change in flux? Well, it's going to EMF. EMF is voltage. Voltage is is, is um, a potential difference that generates um, or supplies electricity not create electricity. That's wrong to say. You cannot say that, uh, you know, this is creating electricity. You cannot create electricity. Nothing can be created right, or destroyed. Energy cannot be created nor destroyed. You're just transferring energy. And this is also key to Lenz's law. So in this case, uh, we can see that, you know, the example is, is okay, in, uh, in AC and DC. Okay, so how do you generate alternating current? Well, you have a loop of wire, right, in a uniform magnetic field, and then you just start spinning it. When you spin it, you generate an alternating current that is a sinusoidal function, in this case, EMF naught times sinus of omega t, 
Okay, and then of course the uh, peak values is when it's perpendicular because sine of 90 is one. How do you generate direct current? Well, all you have to do is you gotta uh, do the opposite. Right? So this is the basis, okay, of the economy pretty much. Without, without Maxwell's equations, you would not be able to, uh, you know, get the whole society running right now. The electric uh, components that run your computer, you know, depend on Faraday's law. Because there are a bunch of inductors. We haven't talked about in inductors yet, but basically solenoids, right? Your computers, solenoids, capacitors, resistors, you know, whatnot. A bunch of loads that depend on Faraday's law of induction. Because, because the current that is supplied to your computer is what? It's not direct current, right? The current that comes out of the outlet has to be alternating current. And that alternating current comes from that um, AC generator, okay? That is basically uh, energy transfer from, from motion, from a uh, moving river, right? In a dam. Uh, it could also be by wind, you know, windmills. Windmills kind of take energy. There are many ways to, uh, uh, you know, to generate uh, renewable energy. So this is an example of renewable energy. Okay. Now let's talk about uh, what happens when you have several loops of wire in a coil. So Faraday found that, uh, you know, he did his experiment. And, uh, but before Faraday, right, Orsted, the Danish physicist, the Danish physicist, uh, you know, he forced the actual, like, first science, first um, to find the relationship between electricity and magnetism. And so, and so, Faraday, right, afterwards, uh, you know, these this experiments, he figured out that if you have a change in flux, then you generate voltage, you generate current, voila, you can create, you can uh, supply uh, you know, energy to many different uh, houses, to many houses, just uh, going to a dam and putting, you know, a wheel and start letting it spin by the motion of the river and whatnot. But then he also found that uh, when this loops, right, when you increase the number of loops or coils, right, because you, you have a single loop, it generates, right, uh, induced EMF if you have a change in flux. But then the idea is to generate a lot of uh, a lot of EMF so that you can supply a lot more houses. So how do you do that? Well, you gotta have coils. And when I mean bigger coils, I mean big coils. If you look out, uh, you can see a bunch of transformers outside in the uh, you know in the wire connection. <laughs> have transformers, and these transformers are big big coils with many different you know thousands of turns. And this, okay, is basically the number of turns is directly proportional to the EMF. So the more turns, the more EMF you can generate by far this one. So then, um, you know, the more uh, a closer version to the general version of Faraday, EMF is minus n d phi dt, okay, where n is the number of loops, number of turns. And of course, if you have a magnetic field through the coil, you're going to have a uh, change in flux. And it's going to create AC, AC uh, current, right? Because it's going to be varying. Uh, suppose it's varying as a function of sine or cosine. So then it's going to be uh, alternating current. So let's say that you want to find the um, EMF induced by the coil and its own change in flux, right? Remember, by Lenz's law, uh, this same coil has to generate an opposing magnetic field uh, to oppose the flux, the change in flux. So what is the back EMF? So this is when we come to uh, back EMF is, is basically the EMF induced. Right? So this is the opposing EMF, uh, which is going to go intuitively, it's going to go in the opposite direction. Uh, of the original EMF. So d phi d is going to be d phi d dt times the area times the number of turns, right? So let's suppose that you have d 
this example, you have a thousand turns, you have a cross area of three centimeters squared, and you go from one Tesla to minus one Tesla in one twentieth, one hundred and twentieth of a second. You substitute your values, right? You do your start and then you uh, find that the factorial is minus seventy two volts. Um, so therefore, the back EMF has to be opposite to that, which is seventy two volts, and it's going in the opposite direction. So that's kind of kind of weird to think about, right? You have switch, you have current flowing in one direction, and then you have another current which is the produced by the back EMF flowing in the opposite direction. Okay, so uh, this is all Menzies law. And Menzies law, it can be um, mechanical inertia, uh, if you remember, like mass is inertia. So this uh, effect that is produced by Menzies law. to mass, right? Mass is inertia. Okay. Well, I was talking about transformers earlier. And uh, well basically over here, a simple transformer, is when you have two uh things, right? And then uh, in this in this uh circuit, what you're going to have is you you're going to generate right some some voltage source. You're gonna have a voltage source that generates a current. That current generates a magnetic if you have um, a changing magnetic field, right, you clearly going to generate, okay, an induced current on the other circuit, the circuit that's next to it. Okay, so then um, here you have another example um, where you have a coil, you know, right on a uh, loop of iron, right? Iron is ferromagnetic material, and it's also a great conductor. So now, suppose that this uh, this coil is clearly, you know, isolated on the uh, on the uh, loop of iron. And so, if it, uh, what I mean by that, it's probably got some uh, dielectric material. You know what I mean? It's not uh, allowing electricity to flow through from the iron to the coil. And so. What happens is that, uh, you know, uh, you probably have before, is that uh, if you put, you know, a block of iron to a coil, right, to some solenoid, the magnetic field is going to get amplified, okay? So now, why why does it happen? You know, it's kind of uh, interesting to look at. Why does the magnetic field get amplified? Well, clearly, it's a ferromagnetic material. And a ferromagnetic material can uh, behave very, very easily. With uh, magnetism, so it's a very good friend of magnetism. And this ferromagnetic material, what it does, it adjusts its domain, its, dom its magnetic domain, in such a way that it amplifies the strength of the magnetic field, so that flux will be greater. Now um, we're going to talk about the general case now of um, Faraday's law. So Faraday's law is just EMF equals minus D phi dt multiplied by the number of turns you have. But then, you know, they did some experiments and they found that um, even though, you know, there's no, um, there's no magnetic field. So in this example, take a look at the, at the solenoid, right? The cylinder, the blue cylinder has some magnetic Right, which is going from the okay, in the blue arrow direction. So what I mean by that in this direction. That is the direction of the original magnetic field. Okay. So what is uh, because it's a solenoid, right? You can do you can do the right turn rule for each loop, right? For each. So imagine you just take one loop, you do the thumb rule, and then you find out which direction, okay, the current is. So the current has to be in what direction? So if it goes like that, okay, it clearly has to be, okay, look at it. So if you are the perspective coming from, from the cap A, right, so suppose that 
okay, you're over here, you're standing here, and you're looking, okay, you're looking at the cylinder from cap A, right? So if you look through it, okay, you can imagine the magnetic field go inwards, right, going forward. So the current has to be in the clockwise setup. So that's the general direction of the current. Therefore, if you um, think about it, right, if you do the each section of the wire, the uh, magnetic field always is okay, inside of the, of the solenoid. A uniform, but outside of the solenoid, the magnetic field is negligible. Okay? Like I mentioned, it's negligible because it's very low. Okay, the magnetic field outside of the solenoid is almost uh, negligible. As you can see, right? magnetic field lines have to travel Okay, long distance from here all the way back. So the separation of the magnetic field lines will be much greater, which means that the magnetic field line uh, strength okay, per, per unit area, right? It's a plus. So magnetic field strength over here is going to be very, very, very weak. We say it's negative. So then, how come that, uh, let's say that you have another loop of wire? Okay? So you have a loop of wire. Have a galvanometer. You know what a galvanometer is? It measures amperage. It measures the magnitude of the current. So then the galvanometer uh, a reading, right, in the in the uh, current. So it says it's, there is current through the loop, but then you're like, wait, how come? There is no magnetic field outside. At least it's negligible, right? But still there is the current, and uh, you know use. Already, uh, the magnetic field that is induced has to be opposite to the original, and therefore the direction of the current is also opposite. And so, um, but remember, this, we're thinking about the current flowing through this right, this long solenoid. It's, in, it's increasing. Right? Otherwise, it wouldn't be possible for you know this, uh, to have an increasing right opposite um, uh, induced magnetic field. But you know how come? How come that uh, there is uh, this uh, induced EMF? Right? So if you have a induced EMF, there has to be longer distance. And then we go back to the um, original, uh, you know, EMF voltage, a, bit, a, a difference, okay, a potential difference is defined as the negative integral of eta, right? Where, um, or dx, usually it's dx, right? So voltage, potential difference, the negative integral from some point A to point B of the electric field, right? So electric field is key, uh, the DR, right? And so um, if you have an electric field, that means that you're going to have, uh, you know, some voltage. And so if there is no other way that you can generate an EMF, then the answer is there is an there is an electric field in action. An electric field is acting on that loop of wire which has the galvanometer. And then you have a reading current is flowing. And so Faraday uh, found out that uh, it is you know from the original definition of uh, Voltage, right? Which is very similar to Faraday's law. You find that uh, the closed loop integral of is going to be minus d phi dt. And so, what do I mean by that? What happens is that in this case, you know, usually we think about the electric field to be a, not, uh, a conservative field, right? What is a conservative field? Well, right, gravity is a conservative field. Because um, you know the work done uh, by gravity will not change the energy, right? So the energy is not changed by a conservative field, while a non-conservative field, let's say friction, right? Uh, you could think of friction as a non-conservative force uh, is going to, of course, change the energy, right? It's going to suck up the energy. So what happens here is that the electric field is no longer a vector field. It becomes simply one. 
in this vector uh, is basically carrying the charged particles on the local wire. And what happens when there is uh, an applied uh, force, right? Some something is carrying, okay, an object in a path, right? It's path dependent. In this case, it's path dependent because when we talk about non-path dependent forces or, or fields, then uh, if you take the closed integral, right, the closed loop integral has to be zero, right? It's conserved, must be conserved. So now in this case, the electric field is independent. And so we say that the closed loop integral of E dot ds is not zero, but it's minus d phi dt, the generalized So, um, so this is this is the important uh, you know set of Maxwell's equations. Uh, it closed the integral of e is minus d phi dt. Uh, let's talk about so so here's a, a schematic right here's a drawing of what happened. The electric field, uh, the electric, you know, field uh, vector flowing wire, right, in the counterclockwise direction, it's carrying, it's carrying the charged particles, right? It's carrying the neutrons, and that's what generates this, uh, EMF, right? Because current is a flow of electrons, so therefore this EM, this this electric field must be carrying the electrons. So it's kind of like a work equation. So let's find the magnitude of the electric field. This will induce the electric field um, at the points outside and within the magnetic field region. And the magnetic field is uniform, right? Okay. So the, the circular area, the shaded area, and the electric field must be tangential. Okay. Um, and so the magnitude of the magnetic field will be constant. On the integration path because it's a loop. Now, if you were to go to Cal 3, once you take calculus 3, you might see that it might differ for different paths, right? It will not be constant. If that's the case, then you have to actually use the integration techniques. But in this course, uh, you know, you don't have to worry much about the integration. Uh, you, you just have to know that a loop integral, okay, for it's 2 pi r, right, multiplied by the field. So the electric field multiplied by two pi r is e dot the L, e dot the s for uh, for a circle of wire. So first, let's mm -hmm. talk about the uh, EMF. Okay, the induced electric field out of this circular path of integration. Okay, so here here is the circular path of integration. Right? Now we're going to think about what's happening outside. What's happening here? Okay, so R is going to be this is this is what we're going to do. R can be this or R can be this. Okay, but what does not change? Okay, what does not change is this cross-sectional area. This is where the flux okay is constant. Okay, so then um, E that it becomes the electric field, we bring it out of the integral, it's constant, multiplied by the integral of ds, that's 2 pi r. So phi b is ba multiplied by the area, right? So we have here the cross section area is pi r squared, where the capital R represents the radius of this shaded area, right? So we're thinking about this shaded area, right? That's the, that's the cross sectional area that we're thinking about for flux. So we solve negative. Right, we take neg we take negative d phi dt, we get pi r squared d b dt. Well, the b dt in this case uh, would be would be changing, and so we get that the electric field, okay, will be the square of the radius, okay, distance for the shaded area, right, the cross section area, divided by two times the radius of the integration path that changes. Right, you can increase it, you can decrease it. Multiplied by the changing field. Now, when R is less than capital R, it's uh, going to be okay dependent. 
linear function, right? So inside of the initiation path is going to be a linear function. So we get that the electric fields are halves times d phi times db dt. And then if we do an IS graph, we find uh, we plot electric field over the distance, okay? And then first is a linear function, and then it falls off as uh, the inverse of the distance. Okay, so um, this is electric field, and here we have uh, some supplementary material. So let's go over this if we can uh, with our understanding. So let's review. Uh, we talked about how uh, you know flux changes where it's not constant, where it's changing. That flux, um, you know, in a non, in a uniform magnetic field is, uh, if it's outside of a magnetic field and the area is constant, well, it's going to be zero, right? If I dt is zero, so there's no EMF. When it enters some magnetic field area, we're, we're, we know that dv d phi dt is going to change, right? So you have to consider, you have to remember, okay, Newton's law. You have to think about what is it that you want more of or less of? So in this case, you have more of field lines coming into the page, right? So therefore, less of that. And how you do that? Well, you have all you do is you make more field lines coming out of the page, right? So you make more dots. And based on the idea, you know which direction the current will be flowing through. So that case will be. Yeah, uh, when I think uh, I, I didn't hear you said this, you know, for this kind of a uh, uh, magnetic devices, transformer or the, or the other things, you know, the magnetic flux is mostly concentrated on the magnetic material, okay? Then the phi is a constant, no matter um, from this coil and that coil. So that's why transformer works, right? Because now if a phi is a constant, so the two coils, the primary and secondary, the voltage, it depends on the N. So that's what transformer works. Now, when, it, are we gonna have the, I think I, we will have the, the common quiz number two, number three on Monday, right? Yeah, April 3rd, yes. Monday, what time? Does the student, do the students know? I don't think they know, but, um... I'll I'll figure out uh, you know from Dr. Jano I'll I'll ask Dr. Jano what time it will be. I think do it we, be. Do we have a, some kind of re review that. session for for them to prepare them for the two and set three? Yeah, session. I thought I should. I, I'm I'm not sure. I already sent what? emails before emails before about uh, the dates of the each respective review session from uh, Dr. Fe I'm not sure if uh, the students, uh, you know, went to the review sessions, but I, I did send the email. I sent the email. You, you could, can you ask them if they know the review session? They should uh, should they, you know, attend the review session, right? Did you guys uh, go, go to the review session? Just type type something to see if you did. You say yes. Person. Okay. More people went to the review session. Did anybody else uh, want to go to the review session? Karen, Dominic, Ivana, Vital, Jonathan, Molly, and Pablo, did you go to the review session? The only one person so far. Because there were uh, two review sessions by Federici on, uh, I think, sixth, I think, two days, three days ago, and, and uh, yesterday, I think. Yeah. I mean, in either way, um, Dr. Shin, I, I will do. 
the most relevant material this weekend. If I have that material, I don't have the time. So, um, you notified the students. Yeah, I did notify the students before. So only one person. You do review. Yeah, I'll do the review uh, online. I'll post the video. I'll I'll show. I'll send you the link so that you can check it out. And uh, but of course. Okay, oh, very inconvenient. One of the students says that uh, both review sessions were during class, so uh, it's, it's probably uh, conflicted with the student schedules. But yeah, yeah, I mean, I think Dr. Federici most likely uh, recorded this review session, so I'll, I'll ask Dr. Federici to see. Uh, we can somehow uh, retrieve the review sessions, right? Is it is it available to the public, or it should be? Either way, I will ask Dr. Federici to see if he can he, uh, give us the links to his videos, and then I will send the email with the link to everybody, on both sections. And then uh, I'll make my own video as well. So. If you have any questions, let me know. Okay, right now, if you have like any concerns about any of the topics I mentioned, that we're going to be on the exam. You know, Gauss's law, Biel-Savart law, voltage RC circuits. There's not going to be so RC circuits, voltage, uh, Ampere's law, magnetic forces. You know all those things. So if you have any any uh, you know doubts, any concerns. Uh, the last few minutes we have. Because um, the start is now is going to be for the final exam, right, Dr. Chin? It's probably covered. Yeah, the, I think so. Final exam. Yeah. Law and the in, and the induction and also the AC circuit is a, is on the final. AC circuits, inductance, and RLC circuit. AC circuit, yeah. Okay, so uh, I think uh, this is it for now. Thank you for coming, and uh, I'm gonna stay here for another thirty minutes just to open to questions uh, in regards to like. Uh, common exam questions, right? If you, um, so I, I don't know if you know Dr. Jano's page. I'm going to share with you right now. Dr. Jano's uh, many different uh, past common exams with answers and solutions in them. Um, you could look at the non uh, answered version, right? The empty blank version of the exam and try it on your own. Uh, of course, Try the most relevant questions, right? Don't don't, don't spend too much time on part is for like uh, things that will not be covered. Um, but uh, you know, if you have any doubts, any concerns, let us know, and we should help you. So you can see this right now. You Jano, and then you type Jano, and it should be like the. Go to web.njit.edu uh, slash slash. Somebody says um, on that page, which exams would you recommend on, uh, as studying more? Because I see some from 2011, and I'm worried because those aren't going to be like the exam we take Monday. Uh, well, let's check it out. If I could help you sorting out questions, uh, I think the most recent ones are the most relevant ones because that's usually the trend. You know, the recent exams are probably the most similar ones to the uh, upcoming ones. So let's take a look at uh, common exam number two. Somebody says there is there are still relevant ones from 2003. Yeah, I mean. Physics 121 is a, you know, it's a very general course, 
So they don't go into much detail. Uh, and that's why the concepts covered are, uh, you know, uh, not too complex. So then they generally just put things, right, uh, that um, cover specific topics. And it might actually be the same question. You never know. Uh, you just check them out. But uh, let's see. We'll take a look at uh, exam sample six, for example. Um, dynamic code, two capacitance uh, charges, I mean, two microcoulomb charges are located in vertices of the square. Okay, so this is asking you to determine the electric potential, right? This is relevant, so you might, you should try question one. Spring the pin. Okay, uh, you have, uh, you know, two charges, determine the electric potential, there you go. And then for two, 15 centimeter radius conducting sphere is charged onto the electric field uh, just outside 120 volts. The electric potential of the sphere relative to the potential uh, far away is, so here, yeah, you should try this one as well. Okay, this one, anything that has to do with uh, potential difference, okay, uh, due to uh, charged particles, right? Or any charged objects, conducting spheres, non-conducting spheres, that's good. So I would say I think 2013 is a pretty good uh, exam to review. Um, definitely, because there are going to be RC circuit problems. Okay. So you know, voltage problems, you're going to have. Capacitance, you know, the equivalent capacitance, you have to find the equivalent capacitance. Uh, and then find several characteristics, properties of the circuit. Yeah, definitely try exam 2013. It's a, a very good, it's a very good review. Um, okay, so let's see what else. not so much about power, okay, not, it's mostly about, uh, you know, voltage, okay, Ampere's law, Leo's about law. Um, this one probably doesn't have many examples from Leo's about law and magnetism, so you have to go to the third common exam. Okay, because this is a 50-50 split between exam two and exam three. So, um, try 2013, 2013, right? That's sample six. And also, the solutions are over here, I think. Yeah. The solutions are here. Um, I mean, if you have any questions about how it's. And uh, we can go to exam materials. And let's say we want to look at. Spring 2013, right? Sample example two. Okay. Or one. Let's let's look at one. Oh yeah, this is very good. This has Q equals uh, F equals Q V cross B. So you have to do that. Yeah, it's good. Practice. F equals Q V cross B. This is a uh, of Arlo. Okay, try some of these problems. Excuse me? Yeah. Uh, could, could we do uh, number 11 on exam uh, number two for common three? Comment to is a capacitor. I'll, I'll be back in a second. I'll be at, I'll be back in a second.
would you be able to go over the formula sheet with us and like look show us what formulas do you think would be very important for this exam because i feel like i'm very reliant on it and i've been getting lost in the formula sheet while studying very good, very good suggestion <laughs> yeah, when, when you do review i suggest you go through the go through the formula sheet that's a good 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 point and tell the students which formula sheet is more which the formula which formula is more likely to to be used in the, in the, in the test I apologize. Did you start a question yet or no? I know. I'm looking for um, the formula sheet since somebody asked uh, to go over it. All right. So I have it here. Let me increase the screen now. Let's find out. Um, all right. So here we have. You all need to know. Uh, okay. This first section is very important, of course. Uh, fundamental units, fundamental constants like uh, permeability of free space. Uh, you might you might need to use permeability and permittivity, free space, epsilon naught and mu naught. Right? These two are very important. Um, any con any uh, you know con conversions, right? Are important. All of that. You might need to know the mass of the election. The equation for the electric field is important to know. The force is well pretty easy to derive, right? From that, multiply by the charge. Um, of course, remember the the electric constant, constant. And uh, of course, if you have a, I don't know if you have T thirty six world calculator. But the uh, T36 calculator has um, all constants that you need for the exam. You can just go to, you can go to second, you, you hit second, and then you go to constants. And then you can find all constants you need. You have speed of light, Planck's constant, Avogadro, uh, you have mu zero, you have uh, epsilon zero, you have the mass and the electron mass. You don't have to waste time looking at the formula sheet if you have one of these. I'm pretty sure some other calculators have a similar set of saved constants. And of course, I think you are allowed to bring a graphing calculator. And many graphing calculators have the um, feature that you can save data in the graph. You can save the constants. So you don't have to waste time writing, typing the constants since some of them are long, like um, you not, right? So it takes a while to type. So it's save some time, right? Um, let's see. Um, of course, well, that's uh, okay. You need to know. Hold on. You definitely need to know um, from this the of voltage, right? You need to know the definition of voltage over here, the integral of the electric field, integral of kdq over r, that's voltage. Uh, of course, they don't show you the other definition. I think you don't need it, uh, but the other definition is uh, the negative integral of the electric field dotted with dr. That's 
voltage. Um, okay, so of course you substitute this by the electric field, and then you have a negative integral of a q divided by squared Way to define voltage. Um, let's see. Okay, you definitely don't need to know uh, the electric field due to a conducting sheet of wire, or I mean a conducting sheet, so sigma over epsilon zero. It's probably not necessary. Um, if you know all of this, you wouldn't really need it. You need to know the definition of uh, electric flux. Okay, you need electric flux, uh, magnetic flux. I don't think it's going to be covered. Okay, magnetic flux, electric flux. Uh, yeah, flow. You need gases though. Okay, so e dot dA integral e dot dA and a flow. This definition of voltage is the change in potential energy divided by the charge. Uh, oh, look at this. There, this is basically the same as this. It's just uh, already, uh, you know, dotted. They already took the dot one. This formula sheet is the one that you're going to have on uh, Monday. What is the yeah, voltage definitely something that has to do with voltage. Um, Q equals C V. Remember, you know, like the how to find charge due to a capacitor with some voltage. Uh, of course, you have to know how to find the equivalence capacitance. You have to know how to find uh, resistance, right? Using Ohm's uh, equivalent resistance, resistivity. To know how to find resistivity. So I'll say, yeah, all of that is random. Yeah, pretty much all of this. If you need to use uh, substitute rule and junction rule, they are important. So you need to know Kirchhoff's loop uh, and uh, junction rule. Okay, so that's very good. All of that. Yeah, you know th this junction rule and the Kirchhoff rule. You, I say most mostly, they will not ask you to do a problem with multiple, you know, uh, uh, simultaneous equation. Usually it's one equation to solve one unknown. Okay, that would say you have to use function rule and loop rule. Each time you use the rule, you, did, you, you calculate one number, one parameter, either current or voltage, you know. Okay. That's usually the way. I think we, we did an in-class test for this kind of thing. In class test we did it was, was to was to tailor the the the, the common quick problem. Yeah, I remember that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I think you suggest this was a problem. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay, you suggest it. Yeah. I we, we, we ran it, yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay, uh when you want to end today and I were would uh, would uh, you know uh, call uh, Rich Jano and uh, ask some things? Then if there's anything uh, you have to know, I will call you. Okay, the weekend. Very good. Thank you, Doctor Chin. Juan. Okay. okay. Juan. Yes. Uh, could you do number number ten from uh, Common Exam three, example number two? That's oh, good. Good. You, he has he has the exact exact problem to ask you. That's very good. 
Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. So exam three, question two, right? Yeah, exam, no, no, exam three. It, common exam three, example number two. That's the test because there's multiple tests for each common. And then question number 10. I think that is the one I was in, yeah. What is the energy of an electron that has been to a perpendicular electric and magnetic fields? If electric field is four kilovolts per meter and magnetic field is eight point millitesla. Yeah. So let's do it. So let me open this in. It's going to be difficult to be web expense. I'm going to download it. Gonna... Problem asking you, you calculate both the electric force and magnetic force See when they're balanced. For the, for the kinetic energy, yeah. Kinetic energy, yeah. So it's going to have Again. some sort of motion, I believe. Let's find out. I'm going to put it on one note because uh, the web expand. When, uh, you know, in this WebEx, you cannot write on, on the computer to let the students see, right? Right. You have, you to, have, you have to write on a piece of, uh, take, take a photograph and uh, load up, you know, uh, for students to see on screen, right? Uh, not necessarily. Actually, um, you can do it through the mouse. You can write using the WebEx tool for the mouse, but it's usually very difficult with WebEx because uh, it randomly crashes. So there is a bug. The code, uh, so I usually just use uh, OneNote, uh, which is more reliable. Okay. Okay. Okay, so let's figure out what's going on. Okay, so we said two electric, two we have an electron has been deflected. Mm -hmm. So perpendicular electron deflected means it's not getting not getting there's no force applied, right? So we can imagine the electron going in this direction, V, with a speed V. So it's not an acceleration, right? It's not accelerating the particle. It's just going at a constant speed. Uh, and so we have an electric field and a magnetic field. And, and they are both perpendicular. Well, imagine. Okay. So let's think about what it means by uh, perpendicular electric and magnetic fields. So in which direction will you, would you make the you know the electric field to go? Um, well, let's see. Let's say the electric field will go down. No, so if the electric field goes down, let me bring a different color. The electric field goes down, then you want to make sure, okay, you find what the electric force is going to be. Right? So usually the electric force, right, goes in the direction of uh, opposing, you know, charges. Which, which are going to attract. But now in this case, since it's a negative charge, EQ. Right? So the force. EQ. Q is negative. Q times, okay, E. Excuse me, Q times. Um, you have to remember, you know, the electric force is, when the Q is negative, electric force is opposite of the E. Electric force is opposite of the electric field. But the force equal to QE, if Q is negative, the force is electric force, you know, in opposite yeah, direction sense. of the E. Yeah, so 
Dr. Chen is absolutely right. The problem, uh, when, is this the problem? I couldn't see it. Is this the problem? It's uh, as as I think I mentioned it to you before. It's uh, the J.J. Thompson's in uh, Nobel Prize experiment. Yeah. See sure. how the electric yeah. electric force and magnetic force are imbalanced. The equation will be Q E equal to V B. Yes, absolutely. So e equal to V B. Q V B, right? Yeah. Q V B. Q V B is the magnetic force. The electric force Q E, this is what you said is Lorentz force. Q E plus Q V B is called the Lorentz force. Yeah. But of course in the in the electrodynamic in the graduate course we, we use a rho, not Q. We are talking about distributed charge. Here we're talking about one charge, Q, an electron. I think the equation I couldn't see it. I couldn't see the problem. But I think that from the way it's read, I think the equation Q B, which is the uh, uh, Q E, which is the electric force, Q V B that that's the that is the magnetic force. Right? So, so the 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 electric force and the, because the E and these things are related to, to M, so so kinetic energy. So that's why the the you know the the J. J. Thompson did the experiment to measure the electron Q and M, the uh, the ratio Q over M. So here we. Are. I think in the lecture. In lecture, did you run the 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 the, the J. J. Thompson's experiment? I think I said I said there are two things I I, I suggest you to do. You, I remember one is J. J. Thompson's, the other is the is the the the, the U U two thirty five you know uh, enrichment. The same is isotope you know separation. So, but but uh, anyway, so so. Oh wait, would you just you, yeah. would you just solve for v and then multiply it by half the mass? Yeah, something like this. Yeah. You're solving for v and then you're finding the kinetic energy, right? Right. Yes. So, so look. See so I made a little drawing here. Can you see it? Yes. So here you can see we can imagine the electron going through a parallel plate capacitor, right? Because capacitor generates. An electric constant uniform electric field all throughout. Right. So then uh, they tell you that the electric field and magnetic field are perpendicular, right? It doesn't say it's perpendicular to each other. It just says that the electron is undeflected, which means right. the velocity is not changed. So in order for that to happen, the sum of the forces has to be equal to zero. Right. And we know that if we have a parallel plate capacitor, right, and the force goes this is an electron, right? So it gets attracted to positive charges. So electric force goes up, and to have an equal and opposite force, then the magnetic force has to go down. So yeah, that's yeah. why um, the field the field must go in which direction? Out or into the page? Yeah. Use the right hand rule. Yeah. So which direction? Force Q E. Right. Force so Q B cross E. And then the electromagnetic force is yeah Q B. B yeah. Plus B. Yeah yeah. So which direction in this drawing would you say the magnetic field is going? Did you hear me? Sorry, my internet is very bad. I can hear you. Yes, I can hear you. Yes. Okay. So you have to use the right hand rule, but you have to remember that it, because it's an electron, right? It's gonna have to go in the opposite direction. Or you could just use the left hand. So if you use the right hand rule, right, or just the left hand because it's electron, velocity is the index finger. The force has to go well down, right? Because we drew it opposite to the electric field, so magnetic field has to go into the page. Okay. So it goes into the page, but that's what I want to find out. We already know it, uh, the force of um, the electric field and magnetic field are opposite to each other. So we can say that it's an electrostatic equilibrium. So would V just be for B? Yeah, pretty much QB. Okay. To 
um, QE. Q cancels out, so V equals to E over V. But you're looking for the kinetic energy. Right. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. remember what kinetic energy is. Kinetic energy is basically the integral of force time, times the distance, right? So integral of the force that you, of the work done, that's what I meant. Could you just do one one half mv squared? Yeah, pretty much. Okay. Which is, which, you know how you can derive this? Kinetic energy is um, work, work done, right? Right. One half mv squared comes from basically an integral manipulation, so integral of force, some force. with, um, you know, the distance. So force may, so then this is integral of mass times acceleration times dx. Yeah, and, and, you know, the velocity, the electron velocity is from some field, which is voltage. So you, I think the equation you have, you have to use is one is the electric force equal to magnetic force, which is QE equal to QVB. This one quick equation. Then where the V come from? The velocity come from? Velocity come from the acceleration of the field. Another equation you're going to use is to V. This V is a potential V. Different. There are two kinds of V. One is lowercase V, which is velocity. Uppercase V is a, is a potential. And QV is potential. Potential energy. Potential energy becomes kinetic energy. That equation, in, we are going to use a QV, the V is capital V. Capital QV equal to half mv squared. So, for the two equations, one is two v equal to half m squared. This v is capital V, the potential, the acceleration potential. Okay, this is how you get the velocity from the from the from the uh, from the from the from the, the you know the, the potential. So that that's why in, in the in J.J. Thompson's experiment, you have to use two equations. This is QV equal to half mv squared. This V is capital V, acceleration. Second equation is when the electron gets into the field, it first has to accelerate, accelerate to get the electron to a certain velocity. Once it gets the velocity, then get the area which has both the electric field and magnetic field. Okay. This second part of the electric field is different from first part. First part of the electric field is to accelerate. This, this part of the electric field is QE, QE equal to QB, QB cross B. The two equations. Yeah. And you can figure out the answer. Okay, I it's cannot a, see the problem, but I think that's what it, it is. Yeah, no, is right. But for some reason, when I put it in, I, I, get, I don't get 0. 0.7. Like I have one half times 9.11 E negative 31, right? Oh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then times four e three, right? Because that's the the magnetic field. Yes. And then that divided so, by eight e to negative three, and then I square that. And I'm for some reason I don't I don't get I don't get because the field is asking which equation to use. So this part, this part, I guarantee you, it will be in the test uh, for the for the for for the isolo, uh, isotrope, you know, you know, separate. Uranium-235 enrichment, the equation to use is, is, the, is the QVB, which is the, which is the magnetic force, which make the, the, the charged particle, which is uranium, uranium ion, to turn, become circular motion. So the equation I'm going to use is QVB equal to mv squared over r. That is the equation to decide QVB, which is the magnetic force. Magnetic force is centripetal force equal to m v square over r. That's the one equation you have to use, okay? Yeah, uh, in, the, in the formula, this is the, this is the uranium-235 separation. This, I think, the, the, because this is a very practical issue. It's on the news. So the, the <laughs> professor likes to put in in the test. The second, J.J. Uh, J. Thompson's historical experiment. I said that in, in the Cambridge, you know, in the Cavendish lab, Cavendish lab, the first director was, Ma was Maxwell, which is all, which is all the today's technology started there. And as J.J. Thompson did the experiment to figure out the electric, electricity. What is electricity? 
But yet, yet Thompson people were very confused. They are positive, negative, or what mass, what carbon particle. J.J. Thompson figured out the electron cu- electric current, mostly we observe, is electron's motion. But historically, we assume the positive charge's motion direction is the is a current, current you know, uh, direction, right? Yeah, Actually, in most cases, in the most cases, the, the, the particle which moves in the current is electron, which is negative. So this is, but historically, it's already decided. J.J. Thompson was the guy who decided what is the ratio of electron mass and, the, and charge. To determine electron mass and charge, use two equations. As I said, as I said QB, this V is potential V. Okay, that's a, you use what, how many voltage to accelerate the electron to get a certain velocity, which is QV equal to half mv squared. This V is capital V, the potential, the acceleration potential. Second equation is when electron reach certain velocity, then shoots into the into the field, which which is the which is the which is the it's called cathode ray tube, right? Cathode ray tube. In those days, it's called it's called Cro- Crookes tube because they did not know it's, it's negative, positive, you know. But anyway, so when electron shoots the field, then you have both the electron field and magnetic field. Electron field, magnetic field are perpendicular to each other. But the electric force, the magnetic force, is on the same line in the opposite direction. The equation, the second equation, you're going to use the QE equal to QB cross B. So those are two equations. I think once uh, I, I like uh, uh, the, the the girl's question, you know, uh, asking what kind of equation we're going to use in the formula sheet. Okay, and let me tell you again, uh, is QB with V is capital V equal to half m v square. Okay. That says the electrons potential energy becomes kinetic energy. Okay, this is electron it potential becomes kinetic. Energy. This is one equation you use. The second equation in this problem, the QV QE equal to QVB. QV electric force is the electric field. QV cross B is the magnetic force due to magnetic field. Okay. Okay. I think I'm finished. I I think I couldn't see. I'm sorry. I I hope I'm right. No, Juan, you did an excellent job. My, my thing is that I have one half M, and then in place of V, I have E over B squared. And then for some reason, I'm not getting 0.71 EV. Wait, what is EV anyway? EV. Is that? The electron volt. Well, let me tell you what EV is. E is, is the electron charge, 1.6 times 10 to minus, minus 19. The EV is 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19. Oh, right, right, because it's work. Right. So, it's, so for some reason, it's I, work. I, 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 yeah, I didn't okay. get point okay. seven. Our energy, the same thing. Yeah, Q, right. uh, EV, EV is the unit we use in, in, practice, in practice. Like in my research lab, we always said that the, the, the current, uh, the, 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 the electron is hum energy is EV. What will we'll use EV? EV means, let me repeat, EV e is electron's charge, 1.6 times 10 to minus 19 coulomb. Then V is volt. Coulomb time volt is joule energy. Right? Now remember, we said the potential energy U equals to QV. Remember? U equals to QV. U equals to QV. U is the potential energy. V is the charge. V is the potential. Potential time the charge is the potential energy. Then potential energy to be to become kinetic energy, the half m v square. The same as as a, as a, as object, you raise the high m g h. The object is very high m g h. The potential then go down become half m v square, which is the kinetic energy. I do the same thing. Make it clear. I'm sorry, I cannot see the screen. I, I put yeah, it was I, clear. It was I, clear. I, I put the WebEx on my screen and the, the computer crashed. <laughs> I, I, I could only listen to you. So sorry, no, I cannot help more. But uh, but I think Quinn did a very good job. I, the I, mass is 1.6? No, 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 it's 1.6 from 10 to minus 19. I thought it was, it was, isn't it 9.11, e, negative 31? No, 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 9.1 is a mass. 
That's in 9.1 times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms. Yeah, you need you need that for the the equation for uh. Yeah, for, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, what do you call kinetic energy? energy. Yeah. Yeah. Now let me let me repeat. Electron mass is 9.1 times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms. Okay, because the, in our unit, our standard unit has to be has to be joule, kilogram, meter, second. These are the standard uh, units. Once you use these units, automatically they came out right. Let's say we say RC circuit. If R you put, put, put ohm there, C you put para there, coming out R times C is second, is time. Same thing, R divided by L, R is ohm, L is Henry, you R divided by L, ohm divided by Henry is second. It's the same thing. To the potential energy, you equal to QB. Another Q, Q is the electron charge, which 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulomb. You have to use standard unit. Then V is volt. And coulomb volt, coulomb volt is what? Coulomb volt is joule, is energy. U equals to QV, remember? Right. So, the, so the Q you have to use is 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19. Cool on. So that that is to say, one EV, as I said, the 1.6 10 to the minus minus 19. Joule. EV is a joule. It, this joule. Then, if you want to put potential, you want to calculate the, the 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 velocity, you have to half mv square. And this m has to be has to be 9.1 times 10 to the minus minus 31 kilograms. Okay. I happen to remember <laughs> these numbers. Okay. The Q is, let me repeat, Q is 1.6 times 10 to the min minus 19 coulomb. The M is equal to 9.1 times 10 to the minus 31 kilogram. If you put these numbers in the equation, I gave you two equations. I think everything will come out right. I hope I, I'm guessing your problem. <laughs> That was good. That, thank you. Thank you. Did, make, did, did, did what I said make sense? I'm like a blind man, a blind man talking. <laughs> blind man. The students might notice in the class I, I was almost blind, but not completely blind. Here now I'm completely blind. <laughs> but but, uh, but, but uh, figure out, you can figure out if this blind man talking makes sense or not. Let you judge. Did I said make 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 sense? Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, it, it makes sense. Yeah. Okay. 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 Thank you very much. Thank you. And I think it's after nine o'clock. Now you you should you should go go have a rest. You're very tired today now, right? I mean, yeah, I guess, yeah. Okay. Okay. I hope I helped. Okay. Are you there? Yeah, I'm here, Dr. Chin. Okay. I think uh, you, you want to let the students go? Yeah, um, I think it, it's a good point to stop, uh, but uh, if, you, if they have any other questions, you know, I could answer until nine. Okay. Fine. Yeah, I'm just gonna okay. do problems until, if I come across an issue and then I'll ask. Uh, absolutely, I'll be here. Okay. Yeah, just remember, uh, electron balls are basically units of uh, energy. Okay, yeah, that I didn't, I was confused about that. Yeah. It is the energy unit. It's uh, in the, in the, especially in atomic physics and particle physics, nuclear physics, they don't use joule, they use EV. Like uh, they say, okay, like uh, at Stanford, you know, we have the National Lab, Synchronous Radiation Lab. We we make electron hits, you know, the positron, the two particles hits each other. Then what's the, what's the electron energy? The 4G, I think when I did my PhD research, I used the 4G EV electron. What does it mean? The electron 
fall in the energy, fuel, what billions, the EV, as I said, 1.6 times to minus 19. I, I use 4, 4G EV electron to do the experiment. Now I think they can, now I heard about they use tritium, you know, called TEV, tritium. Okay. Uh, in the earlier time, like uh, 1950 and 19, you know, 40, they couldn't have the MEV. And when I was a graduate student, we can use GEV, now they use TEV, <laughs> tritium EV. So the EV is a, is an energy unit, which is 1.6 times 10 to minus 19 joule. Okay, I hope I, I, I helped. Uh, yeah, you helped. It was good. It was good. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> there was a movie called Dead Man Walking, right? <laughs> Dead man walking. I was talking then and thought, where is this a dead man or the blind man talking? <laughs> well, anyway. Okay. When could I go? I have to go and get my legs. Yeah. Problem. Have a good night. I'll send you the videos later. Yeah, the video um, that I'm gonna make is gonna cover questions that are relevant. No problem. Absolutely, 50-50. No problem, take care. Number 11.